Taiwan is one of the few countries that hasn't had a lockdown. It's got a fairly sizable population, but you've, you've hardly had any COVID-19 deaths. Can you explain why? Yes, so um, we rely on the collective intelligence and indeed wisdom of the entire society in the awe of society mobilization because we had this experience with SARS that inoculated all of the society or at least people who are over 30 years old like me who still remember SARS. So when Dr. Li Wenliang uh, last December shared on social media that SARS has ov uh, happened all over again, it gets reposted very quickly to the Taiwan social media and gets immediate notification to the CDC, the Center of Disease Control. And because of that, we started implementing the principle that I described as fast, fair, and fun that takes care of the rapid response, the um, equal distribution of medical masks and other supplies, as well as timely communication that are by itself also viral to counter the infodemic. So would you say that it's thanks to SARS that you know how to handle this? Exactly, because right after SARS, which was in 2003, uh, we decided that we need a full of society debate on the amount of constitutional power that we can grant the CECC, the Central Epidemic Control Center um, or Command Center during uh, the SARS. Because without such a center, um, during SARS we had to barricade an entire hospital unannounced and with no fixed time limit. And that was barely constitutional. So the Constitutional Court charged the legislators to find a better, um, less encroaching on fundamental freedom way uh, in case that SARS happened again. So that is why we have the constitutional uh, design that allow for, for example, the home quarantine design uh, the border checks, as well as the digital fence, that was all thanks to SARS. So how much would you say this was a societal preparation and how much was a, was a technology preparation? 100 percent. The, the, the credit goes to the entire society, whereas in the government, uh, we look at the best social innovations uh, and amplify those messages, such as making the availability of masks available um, on all the um, chatbots and maps and all sorts of different digital channels. Uh, ultimately, uh, the design and the inspiration of this idea come from the social sector, from the civil society. What I'm interested in is whether there were any technological solutions you hit on during the SARS epidemic of 2003 that you're still able to use now. Or was it simply that people were prepared to do whatever it took because of SARS? So it was the people and the way they behaved this time that, that solved the problem. Well, certainly the, the most effective technology that was useful during SARS is still available today, and this is called um, soap. Uh, washing your hands properly uh, with soap uh, or alcohol sprays, that remains the most fundamental technology that any society can deploy. Um, and on the ground, of uh, people's understanding of how to uh, properly wash their hands. Of course, we then developed uh, other technologies such as uh, the whole of society use of medical masks. Back in SARS, uh, the N95 mask uh, was in uh, very short supply because people thought that only N95 uh, protects them. But now we know that if a significant number uh, of people, like nowadays is almost 90% um, or over uh, 90% that has access to medical mask, then that is like a physical vaccine that protects everybody. There's been a lot of debate in, in my part of the world over whether masks are effective and indeed what they prevent, whether it's passing on the virus or whether it's catching the virus. What would you say to any country that is still considering whether or not to use masks? In Taiwan, people care about each other and we build masks as something that A, um, reminds you to wash your hands properly and B, protects you from touching your mouth. And that is the main benefit of masks to the person who wear it. And what we have done 
now is that uh, for people like two or three people in a larger crowd, maybe 20 people, um, a few people wearing the mask sends a social signal so that the person who wears the mask can remind the other people to also protect themselves by reminding them to wear a mask to protect um, their own health. But of course, we know once a majority of people in the same place start wearing medical masks, they start protecting each other. Personally, uh, having wore uh, all sorts of different kinds of masks by now, the, the medical grade mask um, has the advantage of that you can, it's light enough and um, breathable enough that you can uh, wear it for an entire day without um, feeling um, unease. Uh, and in the other uh, non-medical grade masks, which tend to be thicker, um, it doesn't work as much uh, for the entire day of use. And so people will take it off from time to time. And during which time, it's now, of course, very important to keep even more stringent uh, social distancing rules. So what I'm hearing is the, 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 the most useful thing that you, you, you wanted to talk about there was that it's... A, it's a social reminder, and B, it stops you from touching your own face. And also um, remind yourself both, to wash is, your hands properly, yes. Sure, sure. Um, and it's interesting that you chose those reasons rather than uh, maybe it stops you from inhaling germs or it stops you from exhaling germs. Would you say the masks are useful for those as well, or is it much more the, the kind of behavioral thing? The, the, the well, the to. thing is that the, the reason you cited, although it's scientifically sound, uh, it appeals to altruistic uh, or collectivist um, behaviors. And in Taiwan, uh, people primarily care about themselves and they care uh, about their loved ones and will remind them to protect themselves as well. And so in this sense, um, the ideas that I cited has a better basic transmission rate as memes uh, from people to people, whereas if you appeal to the collectivist or a altruistic um, incentive, then it doesn't travel as quick or as um, easily. That's really, really interesting. Um, we're looking to countries like yours um, to, to educate us on how to control the spread of a pandemic in the future. So Masks aside for a second, can you take us through how you stop the spread of the coronavirus so quickly, especially given how close you are to China? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think, um, as I said, the uh, quick action is the most important. We start uh, health inspections for flight passengers from Wuhan to Taiwan the first day of January, which is at least 10 days in advance um, to most other countries. Uh, and the reason is that we have a experience of SARS. And so when uh, Dr. Li Wenliang's social media post gets reposted on Taiwan's equivalent of Reddit, uh, the PTT, everybody take it very seriously and upvoted that message. And so because of this, we were able to gain precious time uh, to set up the Central Epidemic Command Center even before that we had the first uh, confirmed local case. So what did you do with the people who you detected had the coronavirus and how did you trace who they'd been in contact with and where they'd been? For a vast majority of cases, uh, we were able to use uh, interviews and traditional contact tracing methods uh, to get ahead of the virus uh, by um, asking everybody who have been in contact with the person who um, has uh, symptoms uh, to also self-quarantine or uh, do a home quarantine. Um, and for border control, also for people who show symptoms, of course, um, they're quarantined um, in a um, um, hospital, but even for people who do not have symptoms, if they uh, return from a higher risk area, uh, then we ask whether they have uh, sufficient room uh, in their house for home quarantine. If they don't, then we also have quarantine hotels for them to stay. And you made sure that anyone who had to stay at home was on full pay as well? Yeah, of course. And also, uh, we paid them a daily stipend. Uh, of around um, 30 euros a day. Uh, but if they break the quarantine, the fine, the penalty is 1,000 times that. So I'm, obviously we're now talking about contact tracing over here as well. Um, there's talk of using an app because it's more automated. 
but I know that contact tracing involves actual manual work of phone calls and interviews. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are about contact tracing apps and whether they can be seen as a solution. Well, Taiwan has not deployed uh, any app level contact tracing technologies. And the reason why is that we have never entered the um, phase of community spread. Uh, at the community spread stage, I say that um, it's a useful thing, but much like Musk, it only start being useful if a majority of people start using it. So you have to design the same kind of incentive uh, of participatory mechanism uh, to get a majority of people using it. But we've never entered to the community spread stage, so we've never had to design uh, that incentive. Rather, we rely on traditional interview methods and also during the home quarantine, the digital fence, uh, to make sure that we never enter the community spread stage. It strikes me that the interview stage of contact tracing, whether it's in person or whether it's on the phone, is quite manually intensive. And I wonder whether you think if it had entered the community stage in Taiwan, if, if many, many more people had caught it, would it be physically possible to actually do these interviews or would it com completely overwhelm the number of people that would be available to do it? Well, we have uh, run certain simulations. For example, if there are limited community spread, maybe around a hospital or something, then we do a very narrow lockdown, uh, but the locked down area would include uh, the shops and so on uh, with plenty of supplies um, so that this uh, very limited and narrow lockdown can still uh, result in a self-sustaining community uh, for that area. Uh, and so for every other area, we still use traditional methods of contact tracing and so on. Uh, but for that affected area, then uh, a more um, narrow uh, lock lockdown is used. But uh, I must stress that these are all uh, simulations done by a municipality um, and local governments. Uh, the CECC helps them in uh, getting the numbers right, the model and the formula right, but it is uh, for each mayor uh, to decide what scenario to simulate. How important was data in all of this? Well, it's, it's uh, the utmost importance. Um, we trust citizens with open data and so that every citizen is potentially someone who can contribute in the fairness, for example, in the distribution of masks, and also contribute in social innovation. Uh, because every day there is a press conference from the CECC, and everybody who has a phone can dial the line 1922 to uh, inform the CECC of any innovations uh, given the data that is shared by the CECC. And so we make sure that novel innovations are reflected to the press conference uh, as quickly as the, the next day. And so that is, I think, why the data is so important. And also, um, with data, uh, you also need uh, epidemiology uh, knowledge to make interpretation of the data. So it's very important everybody understand uh, what R0 means uh, and what does the model means and so on. Uh, and so we make sure that, for example, our vice president uh, who literally wrote the textbook on epidemiology, uh, record online crash courses a as a MOOC uh, that has more than 20,000 people sign on in the first week, um, including me, uh, to learn about how to interpret those data. That's equally important. So just to be clear, the vice president of Taiwan is an epidemiologist and ran a massive online course for everyone to come well, up to he speak. is the epidemiologist because he wrote the textbook uh, and was in charge wow. of National Health Agency during SARS. Do you think that scientists are held in high enough regard by governments around the world? Yeah, I, I think Taiwan's success uh, can be attributed mostly to uh, the fact that our academic um, authority, uh, VP Chen Jianren being an academician, uh, like the top uh, scientist, but also having the political authority. Uh, and so uh, when VP uh, Chen Jianren advises our CECC commander, um, Minister Chen Shizhong, uh, everybody learns about epidemiology because they take a very humble attitude and say that although we may have um, a lot of knowledge on classical epidemiology, this is the era of digital epidemiology and everybody is in this together. And while we have implemented all the necessary measures, if SARS happened again, 
Actually, this is not quite SARS. This is the, the second version of SARS, SARS-CoV-2. And so uh, it has very different properties and everybody needs to play their part in helping the scientists to figure it out. And so they're basically inviting all the citizens to be citizen scientists. And that is, I think, the most effective way to mobilize the entire society because we're all in this to learn together. This is, this is just fascinating. I've got some notes here um, about some of the ways that the data was used, including um, if someone displayed symptoms to a doctor, there would be alerts sent out to help identify people and there, there were use of QR codes um, to, to help with travel history. Is that right? Can you Yeah, but, but these are, are all just time-saving devices. Uh, so for travelers abroad, it's true that we have, um, if they prefer uh, pencil and paper, there's a, a physical card that they can declare their symptoms and so on. But if they prefer using a phone, there's a QR code that they can fill out the same thing using a phone. Uh, and for people under home quarantine, of course, um, the local household managers uh, and uh, health experts call them regularly to, to check on them. Uh, but if they prefer talking to a chatbot, there is also a chatbot that they can uh, report their temperatures and things like that. But I must stress, these are all assistive technologies and they are not uh, exclusive, meaning that if you do not prefer uh, using the digital means, you can always talk to a real person or fill in a piece of paper. So what I'm getting from you is even you, even though you are you are a massive fan of technology yourself, you're saying that it's you need a reason to use technology. Technology itself is not the answer. It's, it's one of several ways of doing a, a much more important thing, a much more important piece of methodology. Yes, technology uh, is an application of science. And if people do not understand the science behind the technology, then they just blindly follow the technology to change the social norm, often to uh, very adverse side effects. But on the other hand, if everybody understands uh, the basic science uh, behind the technology, then everybody can contribute to civic technology to design better ways to realize the same scientific goals. Um, you also manage to keep businesses open. Can yeah, there's no, there's no closure, there's no how lockdown. How that happened? How did that happen? Well, um, because uh, we have found out that with the pervasive mask use, as well as reasonable social distancing, um, there, the R0 value um, has been under one, uh, and so there is no reason to um, force closure of any businesses, uh, because although that will decrease the R value even more, um, it will also hurt the economy and also people's mental health. Uh, and so because of that, we've only uh, suggested the closure of businesses that there is no way to keep a meaningful social distance, such as intimate bars. Um, however, even intimate bars are now um, discovering ways, for example, with uh, transparent shields or things like that, uh, to keep on the social distancing rules. So the, the rule of thumb is that if they can uh, redesign their uh, internal uh, decoration, their interior, uh, to make sure that social distancing is observed, then they can continue as normal. So obviously everyone's getting familiar with this concept of R0, the reproduction rate of the virus. Anything above one means an exponential growth. Anything below one is very good and means that the, the, the spread is, is dying out. Um, we've heard in the UK that different types of measures contribute a different amount to reducing the infection rate, whether it's closing schools or closing businesses, social distancing, hand washing. I wonder whether you ha had, to, you can call to mind, which measures are most effective for reducing the infection rate and which ones maybe are, are, are over-exaggerated and we shouldn't try and strive for them? Or well, soap, <laughs> hand sanitation. <laughs> <laughs> Like um, there was a journalist that asked me uh, between uh, contact tracing apps uh, and um, masks, what would I choose? And I'm saying, you know, I would choose soap over both. Uh, and, and that is literally true. Uh, masks are of very little use if you don't do hand sanitation uh, properly. 
Uh, and just like masks, apps are only useful if a sufficient number of people use it. But uh, hand sanitation uh, works both individually. It also prompts people to remind each other to wash their hands well. Uh, and so it is um, a, a R0 uh, decreasing device that has the most uh, uh, co cost benefit ratio. It's also very cheap. Uh, and we had to uh, also keep uh, manufacturing the um, ethanol uh, hand sprays. Uh, and so uh, the national like liquor company, for example, uh, stopped their most lucrative uh, liquor lines and produced uh, entirely 75% alcohol uh, sprays instead. Um, and so I think uh, all of this contributed, but hand sanitation is by far the, the most important factor. What about things like closing schools or closing businesses, which you say you didn't need to do, but do you have a sense of how much that would have contributed to reducing the infection rates and, and the schools, as I say? We delayed the opening of schools uh, by a few days but that is only because we want to make sure that all the schools have plenty of supply of hand sanitation equipment, of masks, uh, and uh, of temperature checks and things like that. So this is basically giving the schools plenty of time to make sure that they uh, adhere uh, to the um, uh, level of uh, social distancing and so on that would keep their R0 value uh, under one. And once they are ready, of course, the school season open as planned. Uh, and that, I think, is the, the overarching theme of the Taiwan model. This is not about a, a kind of trial uh, and error uh, of individual measures, but on a much more um, um, universally um, adhere to social mobilization. Uh, and when the CECC say, for example, that you have to keep uh, one and a half meter distance uh, or wear a mask, the entire society actually respond by keeping one and a half meters away from each other and wearing a mask. So if you ask any random person on the street uh, who is the, the champion of this uh, counter-coronavirus, uh, they would probably say it's the people because we did more than CECC have asked. How did you stop people panic buying masks? Well, we make sure that everybody see we have plenty of masks produced. Uh, we started uh, from uh, with a population of 23 million people. Uh, we started uh, by producing masks uh, I think ramping up from below 2 million a day, uh, 1.8 million a day, uh, to tenfold that. So we're now above 18 million medical masks a day, um, and uh, it's still growing. Uh, and all of this is communicated very clearly uh, to the entire population. And the mass distribution, uh, we ensure that everybody with the National Health uh, Insurance Card, which uh, includes all the citizens, but also most of the residents, uh, can just show up to their nearest pharmacy, swipe their card, and now collect nine medical masks every two weeks, or 10 if you are a child. Uh, and so everybody can see the availability very clearly. And so there is no need uh, of panic buying because we nationalize the entire mask um, making and distribution um, community. And so for people who cannot collect at pharmacy because they work very long hours, we also partner with convenience stores which work 24 hours. There was a mask map online. Uh, there? Well, there's 140 mask maps online. But, but there, there was initially just two, yes. And can you just explain what the mask map helped with? Did it tell people where they could buy masks or did, they just, did it just show that right. there so, were enough so masks? Right, so it shows you uh, your nearby pharmacies uh, or if you're in Taipei City vending machines uh, and where they are, uh, what's their stock level, and, and that's it. And so uh, with this information, which is... Um, at the busiest um, hours, uh, refresh every 30 seconds. Now there is no queuing anymore, so we refresh every three minutes. But the idea is that it's a participatory ledger, so that by the time you get into uh, the map, you can very easily see which uh, pharmacies near you are the closest that still have um, adult or children's masks uh, in stock. And so you walk to there, you swipe your NHI card, and after a couple of minutes now, you can see on the map that it decreased its stock by nine or 10 if you're a child. Uh, and so everybody can keep each other honest and uh, participate in this very accountable way of real-time information. And if you don't prefer uh, looking at a map, maybe if you're uh, someone with blindness and, or so on, there's also voice assistance and chatbots and whatnot. 
the last time we met you, you were talking about your hacking background and the fact that you you've convinced hackers to to work with, with for the government, government, if you like, and, and work on these tools with with the government. Um, and the volunteers proved vital for this as well to to what to keep the app online because it was so popular? I think this is because it's not the government's idea. It's this, a social innovation. Um, so even before we start rationing masks through pharmacies, uh, there was mask available in convenience stores. And so um, someone from Tainan uh, with the name Wu Zhangwei or Howard Wu uh, just coded up by himself. Uh, and using the Google API, which very quickly resulted in huge amount of API usage fees, uh, about 20k US dollars uh, that he owed uh, Google um, after just a couple of days of that um, mask map running. So he had to take it down. But it's a really good idea. Uh, and so one of uh, the persons who used his map, um, yours truly, uh, brought that prototype to the premier, and the premier understood the value of it immediately. So when we started rationing through pharmacies, uh, we say we will provide exactly the same data that these uh, social innovators have been uh, constructing by their own crowdsourced prototyping. But instead of relying on customers uh, to report the current stock level, we will just work with the National Health Insurance Agency to make sure that the uh, um, real-time uh, availability is published uh, every 30 seconds. And so because of that, uh, all the volunteers uh, started working on the same issue because A, it builds their portfolio, and B, this is not a government mandate. It's essentially they are procuring government service. This flips the traditional procuring relationship um, 180 uh, degrees because with procurement is a government having an idea of GovTech and the citizens um, through um, uh, SME procurement rules or whatever uh, realize the government's idea. But this is social innovation. This is entirely the social sector's idea and we do whatever necessary, absorb whatever infrastructure costs necessary to realize the, the wish of the prototypes of the civic hackers. So this is the first time the civic hackers really feel that they are like the designers of civil engineering projects like bridges and roads because they have more than 10 million users. So it seems to me like there's there's a lot of trust that goes both ways. The, the, the people have to trust that the government, which is using a lot of big data in this, aren't going to abuse that. And the government, I suppose, has to trust the people to build these systems and not to want to take control itself. That, that's that exactly right. right. And, and with more than 140 uh, developer teams, it's very difficult to have a vendor lock in, right? If one goes unavailable, there's at least 40 um, teams doing pretty much uh, the same thing. And so there's a friendly competition going on. Uh, and it also helps that Google waived the usage fee of um, Howard Wu's uh, or original prototype and kept it running for many months. Can you give us some examples of why the people trust the government with their data? Because let me assure you, it ain't universal. So uh, I think, first of all, the national health insurance system itself is pretty robust. And it's a IC card. And it includes not only citizens, but also residents. And so because the NHI is designed as a single payer system, that if you show any symptom of any kind, you just go to a local clinic, uh, pay maybe five euros of registration fee, and you don't have to uh, spend a dime, uh, even if you have a very serious uh, disease. Uh, and so that builds the trust because it's essentially a system that takes care of people without people having to spend a lot. And so people, even before we use NHI system to distribute masks, already trust their pharmacies and their local clinics a lot by showing up, uh, even if they only develop something like a COVID symptom. Um, and so we don't have people who refuse to report because they fear that it will incur financial burden uh, on themselves. And so that is the, the underlying reason. And now, because uh, after we collect the usage data of, for example, on the mask uh, uh, purchasing, we make sure that we publish only the stock level. 
um, so making the state transparent to the people. But we do not publish any personal identifiable information. So that is to say we do not make the citizen transparent to the state. And that is what uh, trust means and what transparency means in Taiwan. We never mean making citizens transparent to the state. Indeed, even though there are many legislators and um, people who demand uh, knowing more about uh, travel history or about the whereabouts of people who are confirmed cases, the CECC has consistently refused to publish any personally identifiable information unless the traditional contact tracing and interviews fails to work. And then we may be forced to publish uh, the travel history. But these are very rare. On the vast majority of cases, the PIIs uh, and the travel history are both kept uh, from uh, release. This trust has, I think, by the sounds of it, been building for a long time between the people and the government. This just suddenly hasn't miraculously appeared because of this coronavirus. How have you managed over however many years it is to build this trust? Um, first of all, I think this idea of a rapid response of a CECC uh, and of the counter disinformation strategy, what we call humor over rumor, um, has been in the works uh, ever since the 2014 Occupy of the Parliament. Because at that time, there was a massively uh, distrust. Uh, the administration at that time only had an approval rating of around 9%. Uh, and so out of that very severe uh, crisis of trust came uh, the civic technologists, the professional facilitators uh, that helped to liberate the CSSTA, the cross Trade Service and Trade Agreement, uh, on the occupied parliament and around the occupied parliament, uh, spearheaded by more than 20 NGOs. And so it was a massive demonstration with a half a million people on the street and many more online. And by demonstration, I mean demo like showing the people that it is possible to build trust if every day the occupiers read the consensus of the previous day, the rough consensus, and the outstanding issues still to be deliberated. And over the course of three weeks, eventually agreed on four demand, uh, not one less. Uh, and that got adopted by the head of the parliament as official policy. And out of that grew a set of technologies that we call listening at scale technologies that allow people to listen to each other at scale and form policy choices. And after they form those policy choices, we make sure that these um, ideas travel faster than conspiracy theories, uh, than uh, rumors, uh, by using cute dog um, uh, memes, uh, so that all the CECC uh, press conferences get translated by the spokes dog uh, that explains hand sanitation rules, social distancing, uh, mask use, and things like that, and uh, in many languages. And so this is literally our spokes dog, and all of them go very viral among all those different age groups. So we're good at both listening and also communicating. So the way to win the trust of your people is an acute dogma. Yeah. I like mm -hmm. it. Um, can, can you understand why not all governments think like you and therefore why populations don't trust their governments? Or, 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 or do, you, do you just not get why not everyone's doing things like Taiwan? No, uh, no. back when uh, we encountered SARS and had to barricade the entire hospital, there was severe uh, trust crisis uh, between not only people in government, but also between municipal and the central government. Uh, and so we know how it was like because it was very chaotic. Uh, it's just that the entire society gets inoculated by that experience. And we spent a lot of time uh, designing the CECC, making sure that the constitutional interpretations are in place, that the societal communications are in place, that we keep all those negative pressure um, spare rooms uh, at, uh, at active drills every year so that uh, we know SARS will come again. And so I, I think it's just a matter of inoculation. And so all of you now um, have a taste of what coronavirus is like. And so I would say everybody is inoculated. The important thing is that as a society, one need to start deliberating about, for example, data use, whether the social sector, as Taiwan does, 
the robust civil society take control of most of the data applications? Or do you want a surveillance state and delegate that to the state? Or do you want the multinational companies play that role? Uh, and that decision must be made by the entire society. And it will be amplified by the coronavirus by the time that the next wave comes or the next mutation comes. That will determine how your society respond to it. You talked about misinformation a few minutes ago and there was some misinformation about toilet rolls, wasn't there? Um, what, what happened there and what was your response? The disinformation uh, was around uh, this rumor that says, quote, uh, medical mask and tissue papers are the same material because we're producing so many medical masks a day, we will soon run out of tissue bay paper, unquote. Uh, and so that triggered a panic buy. And the panic buying ended just less than 48 hours uh, because uh, our premier uh, spread a, a meme uh, of himself. So uh, I need to show you first the, the front view of our premier uh, smiling happily because we start collecting mass 24 hours. Uh, but uh, in that meme, uh, he shows his bottom uh, wiggling a little bit uh, and says that uh, we only have one pair of Botox each in very large letters. Uh, and then uh, a table that says uh, the masks are produced using domestic material and tissue paper are produced using uh, South American material. And these two do not overlap. Please do not spread the rumor. And, and that's it. And, and this went absolutely viral. Uh, and so people, uh, after knowing the fact, uh, stopped panic buying. And we investigated and discovered that the people who uh, spread the rumor are tissue paper resellers. Go figure. I then heard about toilet roll panic buying in, I think, Australia first, and then it came to the UK, albeit briefly. Do you think it all started with with the, that rumor about them being made of the same material? Well, I think uh, each conspiracy theory, of course, like a, a virus, right, a, a virus of the mind, uh, the meme uh, mutates, right? Uh, so what we need to do uh, is to settle on a rhythm of response. In Taiwan, we always reply with two funny pictures, each having less than 200 characters, like a tweet length, uh, and a very catchy title with less than 20 characters, as you just saw. And that is the most important part because it fits uh, your phone screen and you will be uh, um, liking the, the dog, uh, Spokes Dog, so much uh, that you will just kind of stem automatically uh, share that uh, to, to the people. Basically, have a clarification strategy that responds within uh, two hours. On average, we now uh, respond uh, within an hour or so uh, and make sure that the clarification has a higher basic transmission rate uh, than the rumor. Uh, and then chances are more people will see the inoculation, uh, the clarification message before they see the rumor. And then uh, they have uh, herd immunity. Or in case of meme, I guess it's nerd immunity. <laughs> Virtual high five for that one. <laughs> so let me get this right. We, we've kind of established over the last few years that it's easy to spread misinformation if you make it sensational, if you make it clickable, because it's often just more interesting sounding than the actual facts. And the way you're fighting that is to make the actual facts equally clickable and sensational. You're not trying to beat them, you're joining them and, and I guess being better at it than the misinformers. Well, fundamentally, when we say humor over rumor, we mean humor over outrage, but that doesn't rhyme. So we say humor over rumor. Uh, so um, it, it's that um, in the social media, um, if you're upset about something, something that looks like injustice, uh, people share it before fact checking and that's human nature. Uh, but outrage is very uh, difficult to counter uh, without reinforcing the stereotype that provokes such outrage uh, in the first place. And worse, uh, outrage will cause the person who spread the message to add more toxic comments in order to seek revenge or to uh, denigrate um, certain people, right? And so that leads to polarization, and, and I'm sure you all know all about this. Uh, and so the way that we frame our clarification message is just to trigger uh, a, a laughing uh, response. Uh, and so if you laughed about it, 
the same uh, sense of upset will be then channeled into pro-social behavior rather than anti-social behavior. And so you cannot, you literally cannot feel outrage and fun at the same time on the same thing um, because they're mutually exclusive um, pathways in the mind. Uh, and so because of that, for example, there was a, another rumor that says uh, perming your hair will be subject to $1 million fine starting next week. Obviously, it's not true, but it provokes a sense of outrage. So uh, one hour after it spreads, we have the same premiere here showing that uh, the fine is not true and a young version of himself saying that even I may be bald now, but I will not punish people who look like my youth. Uh, and a fine print that says, <laughs> what we've done is mandating the ingredient to be listed on hair products starting 2021. And the premier, as he looks now, that says, however, if you perm your hair many times a week, it will not damage your pocket, but it will damage your hair. Just look at me uh, at what you may become. <laughs> and so it's, it's truly funny. Uh, and it's good humor because he makes fun of himself not other people. Uh, and so it encourages pro-social rather than anti-social behavior. And you literally cannot get um, outrageous uh, over uh, any of those disinformation after seeing this message. You cannot unsee this message. It will just always provoke a, a laughing. How on earth did you get senior politicians to buy into to this approach? Because there are some world leaders who take themselves far too seriously to to take part in the joke, especially where hair is concerned, I would have guessed. Right. Um, well, it does take a sense of humor. Uh, however, um, I think most people in Taiwan, after realizing that there are deliberate disinformation campaigns going on, for example, during our presidential election, there was a massive disinformation campaign that tried to paint uh, the Hong Kong protesters, the anti-ELAB movement, uh, as rioters, as mobs, so that we will not uh, sympathize uh, with the Hong Kong uh, protesters. And that, because that was a literally the, the most deciding factor in our presidential election. And after realizing that there are conscious campaigns uh, doing that, we started seeking solutions to the disinformation um, campaigns. And people realized that it's either responding faster and with accurate information with a faster transmission rate, or we will have to do censorship and takedowns. But because most people still remember the martial law and we do not want to go back there. And uh, the Civicus Monitor also showed Taiwan is uh, the most open civil society in terms of press freedom, assembly freedom, a freedom of the press, of speech and so on. And so because of that, we do not want to lose that. And so faced with this choice, we very quickly chose this rapid response instead of the censorship and takedown route. And so that formulated the uh, political norm. And so the politicians also had to adjust to that because otherwise the alternative is to go back to uh, essentially martial law. I mean, it sounds like Taiwan is the most opposite to China that you can get. And I, I guess I understand why that is. Well, I, I think the martial law also showed us uh, like what was like, like when we see Dr. Li Wenliang uh, being reminded uh, by his institution or, or being reminded uh, by the police um, and, and even uh, being reprimanded uh, on television channels uh, before um, he gets vindicated. Um, we, we understand how that was like because I, I remember the martial law when I was young. Uh, that was exactly what, what happened in Taiwan during the martial law days. Uh, people get censored, people get disappeared if they don't um, harmonize uh, with the, the party line and so on. And so we, we really do not want to get back there. Final question, because this has all been fascinating, um, but <laughs> I think we've got to stop. Um, what advice could you give countries like the UK like the USA, um, which haven't acted anywhere near as swiftly as Taiwan has, um, in case there is a second, a third, a fourth wave and a new pandemic in a few years time? 
Yeah, uh, I think the important thing is that if you have implemented some uh, close of business of schools, of lockdowns, of uh, at-home shelters, uh, you essentially uh, reset uh, the situation to where we were um, in January. Uh, but you need to use that time to essentially inoculate the society. The society need to come to an agreement to what are the norms that can keep the R0 value below one. I'm not saying that you should copy all everything that Taiwan does. However, you need to choose on a recipe, a set of courses that together has uh, a effect that drives the R0 value to under one. And people need to learn epidemiology. Uh, it's like the, the best vaccination against conspiracy theories and rumors. Because if you know how the epidemiological model works, then no amount of conspiracy theories uh, will affect you because you're essentially thinking from a scientific mindset now. So use the lockdown period, use the um, closure of business and schools uh, as a kind of buffer to learn about epidemiology, about the importance of soap and hand sprays, uh, and then uh, implement as a society uh, a set of measures that will drive the Arnold value below one, and that gets firm understanding by the entire population. And would you say that those, whatever those measures are, has to vary by the type of country? Or is there already in your mind the things that every country should do and that will work on that country? Aside from soap, right. So, um, I'm sure that um, all of you uh, now understand uh, mask is useful, but how to communicate the usefulness of mask depends on the culture. And so I wouldn't say that the medical masks are um, absolutely required. You can do well uh, with um, non-medical grade mask as well if you communicate it properly and people keep uh, social distancing and even better hand sanitation habits uh, without wearing medical mask. Or you can have some medical masks and uh, use um, traditional rice cookers uh, to disinfect them uh, and so that it, you can keep reusing um, it uh, a few times. Like I, I personally recorded videos uh, showing how to uh, disinfect medical grade masks uh, using a traditional rice this cooker. This is just by bringing uh, and, them to a really high temperature to, to kill the virus. Uh, but but uh, no, it, it reaches uh, 110 Celsius only for a few seconds that kills the virus, but does not damage the PPE materials as much. Right. And then it rapidly cools I down. See. So it's all about this, this shape of temperatures. Um, and, and again, People questioned that method and did their own experimentation with all sorts of different technologies and so on. Uh, and so there's a whole kind of full of community deliberation <laughs> about what, how best uh, to reuse a medical mask. Uh, I see there's now papers also coming from international community on using similar methodologies to uh, disinfect N95 mask as well. So keep the dialogue going because the more the masks be, are being talk, talked about, whether medical mask or not, um, they become a social object that people can see that this is normal to improve on it. And so the civic technologists can uh, enter um, this deliberation and bring more innovative methods to people. Whereas th this is a top-down order without people realizing uh, the full benefits and the materials and so on, then people would not innovate uh, on their own. Uh, we see there's many trending uh, hashtags such as the uh, hashtag masks, masks for all, right? Uh, that uh, basically showed um, the, the popular YouTube uh, videos, short clips, uh, how to make your own mask, how to communicate the property of mask to people and so on from Czech Republic and many other places. And these are precisely uh, the kind of things that need to start a cultural norm around mask use. Audrey Tang, thank you so much for your time. And uh, it's been fascinating. Thank you. It's very good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.